Thank you for joining another author's program at the Charleston Library Society. I'm Ann Cleveland, and as Executive Director of America's second oldest circulating library in America, I'm proud of what we've been able to produce during this tragic pandemic. In the few months that we've been hosting these Zoom talks, we've actually realized what a remarkably easy and wonderful platform it provides us to stay relevant and in touch with all of you. At the outset, I want to thank Dutch Reuter and Laura Mina and other staff here who've worked so hard to orchestrate fun content and intellectual stimulation on a broad range of topics. And of course, we love our partnership with Polly Buxton of Buxton Books, who's indispensable in helping us provide our members with informative and entertaining discussions. Today, thanks to another devoted member, Amy Salzauer, an extraordinarily successful businesswoman and venture capitalist, we have another one of her brilliant friends from Harvard joining us. I hope that Suzanne Nossel will feel just as at home here at the Library Society. After all, it was founded in 1748 by young people devoted to learning and freedom of expression. Books are vital to our lives, especially during this pandemic. Great bookstores are vital to the lives of authors, especially today's speaker, Suzanne Nossel. Buxton has signed book plates and will provide fabulous service in helping you get a copy of Dare to Speak. We are so grateful to all of you for participating in this new Zoom format, and we hope you'll join us for more conversations throughout the summer. Be sure to check the website. Again, Thank you to Suzanne and to Amy for this very exciting discussion. I turn it over to you, Amy. Thank you so much, Anne. You know, it's my real pleasure to get to be in conversation with Suzanne Nozel today. Suzanne has been the CEO of PEN America, a leading human rights and freedom of expression organization since 2013. She's done groundbreaking work with that organization on freedom of free expression in Hong Kong and China and Eurasia and here in the US. I, you know, it was such a pleasure to read this book. It is both timely and also a real in-depth look and a very thoughtful look at something that people usually just have a knee-jerk reaction about, defending free speech. Um, Suzanne's background also includes being the COO of Human Rights Watch, she was the executive director of Amnesty International USA. She was the deputy assistant, assistant secretary of state um, for international organizations under the Obama administration, the deputy to the US ambassador for the U, to the UN for management and reform in the Clinton administration. And before that was in the publishing industry as a vice president, both at Bertelsmann and as the vice president of strategy and operations at the Wall Street Journal. So she's been on both sides of this issue, on multiple sides of this issue, and really has been thinking about human rights for such a long time. She's also been a good friend for a long time, so it's really my pleasure to introduce Suzanne. I encourage you, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat, and either we'll get to them at the end, or I'll try to work them into the, the questions that I'm asking Suzanne now. So Suzanne, I guess I want to start with asking what prompted you to write this book in the first place? Yeah, sure. Well, first of all, thank you so much to the Society for having me and to you for putting this together and being willing to dive into the book and uh, actually lead the conversation yourself and to everybody who has joined us. Uh, it's great to see friends and many uh, new people uh, and to meet the community in Charleston. So I'd say the impetus of this book, uh, its deepest roots probably go back a little more than 10 years to my time working for the Obama State Department. And when I got there, I was in charge of US engagement on human rights issues at the United Nations. And one of the major issues on my plate was an initiative by a group of Islamic majority countries that were seeking to ban what they called the defamation of religion. And some of you may remember the Danish cartoon controversy uh, in the years after 9-11 when a Danish newspaper published a series of cartoons that were satirical but depicted the Muslim prophet Muhammad, including with a turban on his head that ended in a wick, sort of looking like 
a bomb that was about to be lit. And those cartoons sparked a harsh reaction among Muslims around the world. There were protests at Danish diplomatic installations. It was extremely upsetting to the Danes, this sort of peace-loving uh, country to see people rallying outside of their embassies and lighting flags on fire, and uh, actually people killed in riots that took place. And in the wake of that, this group of Islamic uh, yet delegations to the UN, the Organization of the Islamic Conference, came together and they sought an international ban on the defamation of religion. Their feeling was Muslims were being targeted around the world. They were victims of religious intolerance. Something needed to be done and that this kind of incendiary speech that was so upsetting to them should simply be banned under international law. They wanted a binding treaty that would have prohibited that type of cartoon from being published or you know, potentially anything harshly critical of uh, a group based upon religion. And as part of the US delegation working at the State Department, we were dead set against this. We viewed it as an infringement on free speech, you know, who would be deciding what constituted the defamation of religion, that you know, we need to be able to debate religious ideas, criticize religious figures. You know, that's part of our public discourse. It can't be taken off limits. And so we were fighting tooth and nail against this effort. And it was a battle that was waged twice a year, once in Geneva at the UN Human Rights Council, once in New York at the General Assembly. And we'd be marshalling votes and writing cables to our embassies around the world, asking them to go into foreign ministries and ask for support on this issue. And you know, as I kind of read into it, it seemed to me like a colossal waste of time that the Islamic delegations were getting nothing out of these paper resolutions that were supposedly aimed to tackle religious intolerance, but were only provoking a big pitch debate, and we weren't doing anything on the flip side to actually defend or advance free expression other than really kind of antagonizing these Muslim delegations. And, you know, we as the United States at the time very much uh, believed that there was a problem with religious intolerance toward Muslims. It was the post 9 11 period. We had an envoy to the Muslim world who was trying to better relations. We had uh, another official at the State Department who was working to improve the image of Muslim Americans here in the United States. So it didn't make sense to me that we were fighting against this resolution, the underlying impetus of which was uh, a valid issue, this concern about religious intolerance. And so we turned the tables and we came forward to Pakistan, which was leading this drive at the UN. And we said, hey, what about we try a different approach? And would you consider getting behind a different sort of resolution, one that would underscore the sorts of measures that we've seen in our own country are helpful in responding to religious intolerance. We've dealt in our own country with anti-Catholic sentiment, anti-Semitic sentiment, and we've discovered that things like dialogue and interfaith uh, encounters and conversation and education and training and the prosecution of hate crimes all can make a real difference in bringing about a more tolerant society. And so we propose to bring together experts from the US Department of Justice with counterparts from ministries around the world to talk about best practices, what works, the new techniques. And I wouldn't say they agreed right away. It was, it was a, a, a pretty prolonged back and forth, but eventually we got somewhere. And in fact, in, in what The Economist called a diplomatic coup, we ended up with uh, a brand new resolution and the defamation of religion agenda went away. They never brought that resolution back again. Uh, every country in the UN system, more than 190 countries, was able to get behind this new approach. And it was no longer so divisive. And what it underscored for me and how it connects up to the book is, you know, the idea that concerns about intolerance, whether it's on the basis of religion or race or gender or sexual orientation, there it's sometimes those concerns and the drive to eradicate those forms of bigotry can cross over into a kind of censoriousness where people are trying to ban speech in the name of protecting marginalized or vulnerable groups, but that in fact, those agendas are complementary, that there is no contradiction between a robust defense of free speech 
and a deep commitment to a more equitable, inclusive, and just society. And that's really the case I try to make in the book. Uh, it also was informed by a lot of work that we've done at Pan America over the last four or five years on college campuses, where you see these considerations bumping up against one another. People want to silence a speaker who comes to campus who has some controversial ideas, or a professor says something offensive in the classroom and there are calls for him or her to be disciplined. And students who are driving forward a social justice agenda and believe deeply in the need for a new level of commitment to eradicating racism, to bringing about a more equal society, I think sort of risk losing sight of the importance of free expression protections to their agenda. And I'm trying in this book to make a pitch to them that free expression is actually on their side. Uh, it's a tool they can use to achieve what they are after and that it's not irreconcilable with their values or goals. Well, I know you've done a lot of work on that college campus issue. And it's something that, you know, is very much in the press and on people's mind. You write about being conscientious with language. And, you know, is that just a polite term for self-censorship? That's such a look. Free expression has never meant saying absolutely everything that comes to your mind. You know, none of us do that. It, you know, if we did, we'd probably be at one another's throats. You know, there are all kinds of things that we think, but we think the better of. And I, I talk about conscientiousness really to, as one of the principles that I think is important to a robust defense of free speech in that it's, these days, whether you're in front of a classroom or you're writing on social media, our audiences, particularly in this country, have become much more diverse. You know, we're talking to people from all kinds of backgrounds. You know, many of our cities, I've become much more racially diverse. There's a much larger population of immigrants living here in the United States. And we have to have a cognizance of that when we speak. We can't just assume we're talking to people who come from exactly the same background that we do. If we're writing on social media, what we say may make it halfway around the world without us even knowing about it. It could reach audiences in Afghanistan or Australia. So there's a different level of conscientiousness that I think is required today of just you know thinking through how your words are going to be received, who might be in your audience, is the phrasing that you're using going to resonate with the rising generation. It's really about avoiding unintentional offense and taking the extra step of due diligence to choose how you frame words, especially when you're talking about something that you know can be controversial. Now, I teach sometimes at MIT, and I feel like no matter what I do, I, you know, I end up, I use a word failure, and somebody says that that was a trigger for them. There's all kinds of things that this younger generation views as, uh, as offensive that maybe previous generations did not. I found it really helpful in the book when you were talking, uh, you have a whole chapter really devoted to a duty of care, you call it, when it, when it comes to free speech. Can you unpack what you mean by that? I thought it was really interesting. Sure. You know, what I was thinking about there is the idea that the obligation that you have to undertake this extra level of caution and care in framing your words varies depending on what platform you have. So for example, I give the example of Megyn Kelly who had her own TV talk show and she made these off the cuff remarks about blackface saying that when she was growing up, this was considered perfectly fine. There was nothing wrong with it as long as you were doing it as part of a costume. And that struck many people as out of touch and tone deaf with it, you know, at a time where, you know, I think most of us kind of came to realize uh, at some point that blackface has probably always been deeply offensive. Uh, you know, maybe years ago people were hesitant to bring it up, but there's sort of a rising consensus that this is not something that you do in 2018 or 2020. And Look, do you expect everybody to know that? Not necessarily. Is your grandmother going to know that? You know, might there be somebody who sort of didn't get the memo? There well could be. But someone like Megyn Kelly, look, she's got a team of researchers and producers. She's got an audience of millions. I th so I think it's fair to hold her to 
a higher standard in terms of that level of cognizance. I think people in positions like that, you know, myself included, and it is, you know, I identify with what you're saying about your experience at MIT because, you know, dare to speak indeed. I mean, I'm now doing all this speaking out about free speech and, you know, I, I'm sure something I say is going to strike someone the wrong way and I will encounter some criticism and there'll be some inadvertent offense that happens. It's almost inevitable. Uh, you know, and yet uh, I, I do think that it, it behooves us to try try to do our best. And I, th I also actually think if you're careful, then if you do make a mistake, it's sort of isolated. You know, people recognize that you've made an effort to be sensitive and they will forgive it. I mean, you know, one issue we're all dealing with now uh, is new pronouns that some people want to use to describe themselves. Not everybody wants to be a, a he or a she. Some people would like to be called they. And, you know, I'll admit when we had the first staff member at PEN America who uses they, them pronouns, it, it took a bit of time to get used to it. And a lot of us made mistakes. And, you know, we felt a little embarrassed and sheepish. This staff member was very sort of tolerant and uh, patient with us, didn't jump down our throats. And I, you know, I also have chapters, as you know, in the book about the importance of apologies mm -hmm. and the importance of forgiveness, because I think we need to have space for that. Uh, you know, and, and it's a kind of a calibration. If someone has taken appropriate care and they've made an effort to think about their audience and to choose their words carefully, if they slip up, I think we need to show some tolerance for that. You know, another situation I talk about where I think the duty of care is heightened is when you're speaking out on a sensitive subject. And, you know, I give the example of a, a professor who went to the UN to talk about the Israel-Palestine issue and didn't realize that the phraseology that he was using was uh, considered incendiary by the pro-Israel side from the river, the phrasing from the river to the sea and that this implied the abolition of the state of Israel. You know, I actually believe he didn't know that. And, you know, he, you know, maybe how would he have known that? It wasn't his area of specialty, but if you are speaking out on a touchy topic, especially if you're not an expert, you know, you, you need to sort of go the extra mile. Maybe you show your remarks ahead of time to a few people who know the subject matter really well, just to say, you know, hey, listen, have I gotten this right? Is there any risk here of misinterpretation? So you're, you know, it's, it's interesting because there are so many debates right now about cancel culture and how you can find your way back once you've made that kind of mistake. We don't really necessarily have uh, proven avenues for how people can find their way back. I know you, you talk about that a little bit in the, in the book, but I just wanted to ask you a question. You know, you acknowledge that speech can be harmful, but does that mean that you think we ought to do more to regulate it and mitigate the damage it can cause? Or how do you think we, we can ha handle that damage if we don't regulate it? Yeah, sure. I mean, look, I think there's been sort of traditionally a, a hesitation among free speech advocates to fulsomely acknowledge the harms that speech can cause for fear that doing so would open the door to censoriousness. And over the last few years, we've had some really interesting and important work done about the risk that those harms these days, and particularly with a rising generation, are being overstated. And that, you know, I'm sure this is some of what you've encountered in your classroom at MIT, that there are kids who say, oh, something you said made me feel unsafe, you know, or unwelcome, uh, or it triggered me, you know, it was traumatic for me. And you're like, hey, wait a minute, I was talking about, you know, corporate America or, you know, employee benefits or some other topic that, you know, to your mind, couldn't possibly wound anyone psychologically. And so their reaction seems sort of absurd. And, yeah, there, there's a whole kind of stream of literature talking about how helicopter parenting and modern life has uh, brought up a generation of coddled, sequestered individuals who are now you know, in college and entering the workforce who are not prepared for the rough and tumble of our open discourse and are, are quick to jump down the throats of anyone who says anything that they don't agree with or who bucks the conventional 
orthodoxy or you know challenges the objectives of social justice movements and you know we have even in my own family some pretty fraught conversations about this because the viewpoints really differ pretty dramatically across the generations i have teenage kids who have grown up in an extremely diverse environment and they're very cognizant of the experience of classmates and friends who come from minority groups who've been targeted by uh, racism, sexism, gender-based discrimination, and yeah, they're deeply committed to trying to bring about a more equal and inclusive society. And sometimes that crosses over into you know, really going after things that their grandparents or their parents may say. And so there can be this disconnect. You know, the way I think we need to cut through this is as free speech defenders, I think we need to acknowledge that speech can indeed cause harms. And whether it's incitement to violence, uh, it's bigoted and denigrating speech that is wounding, and that especially for someone who experiences it throughout their life, you know, who, who uh, you know, is a member of a visible minority and who, whether it's in, in stores or in job interviews or in the classroom, is subject to constant stereotyping and assumptions being made about who they are. You know, speech for those people, and there's evidence of this that I cite in the book, can have serious psychological and psychological consequences. It can impair academic performance. There can even be physiological ramifications. And so I think we need to acknowledge that and take it on board. And even, you know, a microaggression, which is a term I don't like because I, 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 it refers basically to fleeting slights, uh, you know, failing to use the right pronoun uh, to name someone, if you do it unintentionally, would be a microaggression. And to me, it's not the, 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 the term aggression implies a, a level of intent and hostility that I think often is not there when these slights are made. But when those microaggressions are pervasive, and they've actually looked at this in relation to pronouns, when someone is constantly being called by a pronoun with which they no longer identify, it can impair their sense of self and confidence and a sense that they're being recognized and seen the way they want to be in the world. And so the, the incidental momentary lapse that you or I may have may be completely innocent, but if that happens to them, you know, 10 times a week, you can see where that would have an impact. And so I think as free speech defenders, we can't minimize this. We can't wish it away. We can't pretend those harms don't exist. We must acknowledge that they can and often are exaggerated and overstated and guard against that, but also to recognize that yes, certain types of speech can be genuinely harmful and to commit ourselves to addressing that through practical measures, through counter speech, uh, rebuttals, even condemnation, but not, in my view, through expanded government powers to police speech. I argue, and we'll get to this, I'm sure, that that is counterproductive and ultimately tends to hurt those who are driving a, a social justice agenda. Well, let's get to that. So, you know, and it's this week, of course, there's multiple tech CEOs on Capitol Hill. I feel like if I, so once upon a time, I used to write for Newsweek and it was triple fact checked and everything I, I wrote, somebody, you know, multiple people looked at to see whether I was saying something that was accurate before it went into print. Now I feel like my news feed is mostly bots and it's very hard to tell what's really true. Um, and a lot of that is, you know, there's endless debates about what should be the role of the tech companies and what should be the role of government. I think the way I read it, you're skept really skeptical, skeptical of empowering government to clamp down more face forcefully on hateful speech and other kinds of damaging content. Why is that? You know, for, I mean, from my perspective, I feel like the Trump administration, you know, and particularly its conduct over the last few months is really the perfect illustration of why extending the powers of government to clamp down on speech would be so risky and why the framers of the constitution uh, put in place the first amendment and it, you know, it took many years, uh, not until the last hundred years has it really been interpreted in the way that we do today as such a forcible constraint on the authority of government to 
ban and punish speech. But that robust interpretation of the First Amendment, I think, is extraordinarily important in ways that are vividly evident today. You know, when you see the President of the United States saying uh, that, that protesters should be shot or calling out, uh, you know, federal troops to clamp down on a peaceful protest in Lafayette Square so that he could have a photo opportunity, you know, you could see that in the hands, you know, we may fantasize about a, you know, president who would encompass the judgment and equanimity of Thurgood Marshall and, you know, Barack Obama and, and Justice John Marshall and, you know, everybody else who we have faith in, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and make perfect distinctions in terms of what is hate speech, what should be prohibited. And, you know, you can imagine sort of a fantasy group of people who you might willingly entrust with that authority, but that's not what we have. What we have are these elected leaders who have their own ideolo ideologies, they have their own self-interest, they have their own hunger for power. And if you give them this discretion to decide what speech stays and what speech goes, we've seen both historically in our own country and in the present day, as well as in authoritarian settings around the world, that that power will be exercised in very self-serving ways. Governments will use it to protect their own prerogatives, to go after their critics, to silence the political opposition, to suppress dissent. And so I think it's, it, it's sort of naive to believe that we can entrust government with that authority and leeway. You know, it does leave the very difficult question of what do we do with speech that has become weaponized on social media? And, you know, talk about the harms of speech. You know, they're impossible to ignore. You touched on the issue of disinformation. We had new revelations this week of how the Russian government is once again trying to interfere with our election. Our own government is, you know, has decided that even giving credence to that possibility would undercut the validity of the president's victory back in 2016. And so they're very reluctant to come to grips with it at the level of the federal government. And so this disinformation simply spreads. And for many Americans, you know, you, you're a former journalist, so you at least have the ability to look at a byline and other heuristics that reveal whether a news source is trustworthy. But particularly for young people, they don't necessarily have any training on that. We're actually doing a lot of work at PEN America to try to equip people on how to recognize disinformation and avoid being a vector to spread it. And, you know, we think ultimately we've got to inoculate the populace against this because we're never going to be able to completely control it. Uh, you know, there are no borders for any of this stuff. You can't, uh, you know, use any traditional methods to keep it out. And, you know, our free system allows people to set up sham websites, uh, propagandistic outlets. You know, there's a very kind of porous boundary, uh, and, and it's very difficult to, you know, shut these things down. The, the First Amendment really doesn't allow us to in many circumstances. And so I think we do need much more robust policing by tech companies of speech on their platforms, but that, you know, I, I sort of have two chapters in the book about this. The first one is why we need to be leery about unfettered, non-transparent, corporate content moderation efforts, you know, and that's because corporations have their own objectives and interests, they're profit-making entities, you know, what uh, their interests may not align with that of the public. They've also, generally speaking, done a poor job of moderating content. There are all kinds of discrepancies and a tendency to treat certain groups differently than they do others, ideological biases that can creep in, which President Trump, uh, the Trump administration has drawn a lot of attention to. So there are all sorts of reasons why we need to be leery of unfettered corporate control. But on the flip side, you know, I absolutely think that we need to be more assertive. And what I, what I talk about is the need to, we, we're going to see more robust policing of online content. And it, it will happen. Facebook is now subject to this advertiser boycott uh, that has gained steam. You know, this hearing today evinces a much greater level of sophistication in the Congress about these issues that you know, they finally kind of staffed up 
and figured out you know, what Mark Zuckerberg is talking about and what his business model is. And there are regulatory proposals that are being developed right now. So that's going to happen. What I think we need to accompany uh, it with is a much more encompassing and immediate system of content defense, what I call content defense. I propose in the book uh, the creation of an independent global content defender. And how I imagine this is, look, when we are much more aggressive in policing speech online, there will be inevitably more false positives. So more expressions of opinion or articles that are shared or viewpoints that are expressed that end up being taken down, deleted, accounts closed for no valid reason. It's because an algorithm uh, misinterpreted something, something wasn't recognized as being satirical or a joke, something has been taken out of its cultural context and is misunderstood. And I think what we need to equip users with is a ready remedy for that. So a hotline that they can call to say, hey, I just posted something that uh, you know, was a perfectly legitimate expression of political opinion, and yet it's disappeared. And actually be able to get an advocate on the line who can help restore that speech if in fact it doesn't violate corporate policies or the law of the jurisdiction. So I think as we get more aggressive in policing content, we need to create a fail safe system so that we aren't expunging all sorts of legitimate speech at the same time. So, you know, I think defending free speech for all is clear American value. I think uh, we all agree it's it, to some extent under attack. You argue and you call on individual citizens to play a more active role in defending free speech. Empower us. What should individual citizens be doing versus the role of lawyers and the courts. Tell us what we can do to help defend free speech. Yeah, sure. Look, I think when Americans think about free speech, people kind of almost reflexively think of the First Amendment. You know, it's, it's just absolutely intertwined in our minds with the way that free speech is conceived and defended in this country. And yet so many of the threats to free speech, whether it's your students, you know, coming after you for something they don't like that you've said in the classroom or, online harassment on Facebook or cancel culture where somebody who makes a mistake you know, becomes the subject of a mass protest that prompts their university or their employer to discipline or fire them. So much of that doesn't implicate the First Amendment at all because the First Amendment really only regulates state action to curb speech. And so if it's a private actor, it can be an institution, a private university, or even just a throng of people in the internet who collectively are exercising their own expressive rights, but the impact of it can be censorious and can have you know have the net result of convincing just about everybody who's watching that you know it's really uh, not worth the trouble to talk about a contentious issue like abortion or rape or the Israel-Palestine conflict or. Uh, you know, the role of China in the world or how to reform policing because you just get so much blowback and it's so harsh and punishing that you just sort of think the better of it and, and uh, don't dare to speak. So I think what this demands for all of us is a much more forward leading posture in terms of keeping free speech open in our daily life. And the book sort of sets out, you know, a, a pretty robust agenda of how we can do that. And it does require kind of walking and chewing gum at the same time. I think we have to acknowledge the harms of speech because if we don't, we'll get the criticism that, hey, you don't recognize that hateful speech is, uh, you know, can, can wreak psychological damage. So you've got to acknowledge that. You've got to show that you've been conscientious and careful in your use of speech. And then if you screw up, be willing to apologize. You know, if you, and, and I divide these principles into uh, a set for individuals when they're speaking, a set when you're a listener, uh, a set when you're uh, debating free speech questions and policy issues. And so in each of those settings, I sort of try to spell out some ways that you can think about this and even how to approach it in conversation, whether that's around the boardroom table or the dinner table, you know, some things that you can say and do that will keep free speech flowing. Maybe, you know, I'm thinking about what you're saying. Maybe can you 
put it in the context of a specific example. Let's say, what should a university do when a student writes a letter demanding the resignation of a professor who has used some objectionable speech in class? Let's say it's even really objectionable. You use the N-word in class. What would you have a university's response be? Yeah, look, there have been a lot of incidents of that nature that have happened over the last couple of years. And oftentimes it is a professor who may be quoting something from literature. It could be from Mark Twain or James Baldwin or Martin Luther King. And, you know, they've said this many times in class before. Nobody ever objected. And then all of a sudden they say it and uh, they are written up and there is a complaint of racism. People have heard it as a racial slur, and the professor will say, that's not what I meant. You know, I was quoting it. I was using it as a pedagogical matter. There's something called the use mention distinction, which is using a slur versus mentioning a slur. And, you know, many professors sort of have had the view that if you're simply mentioning, there's absolutely no, nothing wrong with that. And, it, 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 you know, it, it shouldn't be misconstrued uh, as racist or bigoted, but a rising generation of students actually, you know, what we've seen is uh, views the use of the N-word as extremely offensive, no matter the context, no matter the intent. And I've, you know, I have a whole chapter in the, in the book about context and intent and how important it is to evaluate those things when you're a listener in order to calibrate an appropriate response to speech. So this has become a thorny problem. I do not think professors should be punished. Obviously, if they're using it as a slur, if they're calling a student the N-word, you know, that's totally inappropriate. I think that you know, really would undercut someone's right to an equal education, especially if it was pervasive. Uh, so, so that is a different matter. But in these pedagogical cases, I don't think the professor should be punished, but I do think they should be educated about how the use of this term and the elocution of the term is seen and 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 and, and uh, they should ask the question of whether they really need to say it out loud because i think there are very few situations where it's, you know maybe an awkward word euphemism to say the n word but you know we all know what that means and when you say it that way it does not offend people and you can get your point across i you know i don't want people to not uh, uh, be able to say what they want to say or even debate the history of the word. There are books about uh, the role of this word uh, in American history. So I think it would be a terrible shame if we took the subject, you know, sort of outside the bounds of conversation and education in the classroom. But I think being cognizant of, of the sensitivities of a rising generation is important. You know, another aspect is, it, it, you know, it's different depending on who you are. If you're a black professor, I think it's construed very differently. And, you know, there are black rap singers who include the word in some of their lyrics. And then there have been incidents where sort of a white person is singing along with the song. And if they say the word out loud, you know, even in the middle of that, people are, you know, sort of, it's just, you know, they've, they, they've really crossed the line. I, you know, I think that's, that it, it, it can get pretty tough. Uh, but I think, you know, going back to the point about conscientiousness, it's like, you know, this is where we are today. This word really, really upsets a lot of people. And so let's proceed with that knowledge and, and, and uh, you know, proceed accordingly. Maybe there's some circumstance where it's justified to say it, but you ought to be aware of how it's gonna be received. I wanna ask you one more question and then turn to the questions from the audience. Because you talk so persuasively about the importance of protesting speech without silencing it in the book. And I wanted to ask if you would talk about what that, what that means and why you think it's so important. Yeah, sure. You know, there can be an impulse when speech is considered offensive or objectionable, there can be a, a wish and an impulse to want to shut it down or shout it down. So if there's a white supremacist who comes to campus, you know, quite understandably, people want to come into the room and heckle aggressively and make it impossible for that person to get their message across. And, you know, at a certain level, that can be legitimate counter speech, you know, the, uh, people exercising their own expressive rights. But when it crosses over to actually prevent the person from being heard, uh, you know, that is exercising what we call a heckler's veto. So it's sort of the person with the loudest voice 
exerting the power to dictate what can and cannot be heard. And if you open the door to the heckler's veto in one context and you accept the idea that it's perfectly okay for a group of protesters to shout down somebody who has been invited to campus to deliver a lecture, then what's to say the next time, you know, the group that did the inviting won't heckle and shout down the speaker that the demonstrators uh, wanted to have. And so it becomes this sort of escalatory battle that prevents both speakers from getting their message across and listeners from getting the chance to engage. And so what I talk about in the book is there are really potent, powerful ways of demonstrating that stop short of silencing. And they're very creative systems. Where, you know, Even at Harvard, uh, when Betsy DeVos came to speak, they unfurled banners uh, inside the Kennedy School and you know, they were silent and, uh, you know, they stood in rows and it was a very potent demonstration that got a lot of media coverage and made crystal clear that she was considered by many to be unwelcome on campus. And yet her remarks were delivered. The principle of free speech was upheld. She could be heard. And I think that ultimately is a, a much better approach. Thank you so much. I remember when we were undergraduates, we used to hiss, so you could still hear. Yeah, hissing is legit. I think hissing is a good technique. <laughs> I'm going to um, go to one or two questions from the audience and then see if uh, Dutch wants to lead questions. So we have one question. How do we reconcile the growing distrust of authority and the top-down flow of information with the ability for almost anyone to go DIY and potentially garner a wide audience. What about the reckoning taking place in society about systemic racism? How do we find a balance between official media that's fact-checked and reflects commonly accepted wisdom and the freedom of people to express their interpre interpretation of current events? There's a lot in there. And, you know, I think it's, it is difficult. Look, we're in an era of kind of an explosion of free expression. I mean, anyone now, theoretically, on social media can build a wide audience if they have something to say that is sufficiently compelling to people. And, you know, you touched a few minutes ago uh, on your experience at Newsweek, and I'm sure back then you had fact checkers and editors and copy editors and whole layers of vetting that went on before what you wrote made it into print. And, you know, that's still the way it works in some media outlets and, and in book publishing. But of course, you can circumvent all of that and put your stuff up on a website or onto social media. And so I have a, a section in the book that talks about the importance of being your own editor that in that context, you actually need to take on a lot of the responsibilities that you know years ago an editor would have performed so that you're thinking about how this is gonna be received by an audience and you're uh, giving that extra level of attention that used to come through that process. And you know, we've also seen at the same time, you know, coming from the President of the United States, this sustained campaign of denigration of mainstream journalism and you know a complete kind of flip over the concept of fake news which i think right after the 2016 election people regarded sort of russian election disinformation as fake news but president trump has used the term very differently to talk about uh, journalism that is critical of him and he's called the the mainstream media the enemy of the American people. And look, the press is not flawless. And, you know, there, I think, are serious issues, particularly in how news reporting and opinion have bled together uh, online and on what I call talk, talk television, which is sort of television news. But, you know, as you know, if you watch MSNBC or CNN, so much of it is not really news. It's, it's talk television. It's uh, all kinds of commentators who are you know, chewing over the news and giving their own viewpoints. And sometimes there'll be a lineup that includes, you know, one serious journalist and then other people who are representing a political campaign or an ideological organization. And it can be hard for viewers to really tell the difference between them. And so I think there are flaws in, in, in terms of uh, how the mainstream media goes about its job. But I, I also think journalism is a serious profession. And there are a lot of really rigorous, smart, hardworking, thoughtful people who are serious about bringing fact-based 
information to the American public. And the president has, particularly with his political base, sought to undercut that completely and convince his supporters that nothing they read in these media outlets can be trusted. And I think that's very dangerous. That's part of why we've stepped up our own work at PET America to combat disinformation. And part of it is just explaining what journalism really is, you know, how reporters source stories, how they verify their information, uh, you know, what it means when there's a byline, whether the person, uh, you know, has interviewed witnesses directly, and, you know, what it takes for a story to make it into print or get the imprimatur of a, a major serious news outlet. And, and I think that's a very important part of education. I mean, we teach students how to analyze a short story. I think we also need to be teaching them how to navigate this ocean of information, credible and not, that they are swimming in day in and day out. I could talk to you all day, but I know that uh, Dutch and Anne asked me to turn it back over to them uh, so that they could handle questions and answers. Dutch? Yes, awesome. Um, Amy, thank you. Uh, thank you for those beautiful questions. And Suzanne, um, thank you for those just pure genius answers. Um, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, really impressed and I'm glad that um, we got to bring both of you here today. Um, this has been incredible. The questions have been rolling in. Um, I do want to note before we start that uh, to congratulate you, Suzanne, because typically we have about 50% uh, turnout rate for our RSVPs. You've surpassed well over 75% of people. So uh, all, everybody who wanted to show up did. So you, you've got a really good crowd and it's you're, what you're talking about is really important. Um, and the RSVPs and the stats don't don't lie with that. Um, so I'd like to start with this first question is, um, what responsibility does the audience have in really listening with an open mind? Yeah, I think uh, a very important one. Uh, you know, as a listener, you know, you're the one who really decides whether speech is going to be heard out uh, and whether you're open-minded and, and might be persuaded or whether you're going to lash out against it and, you know, call the person a, a bigot or a sexist or a racist uh, or otherwise discount what they've said uh, because some aspect of it offended you. And look, sometimes that's appropriate. You know, I think one of the reasons I put so much emphasis on intent and context is I think there is a lot that's fact specific in how we respond to speech and there should be. But I think trying to ferret out, you know, even when somebody says something that, you know, gets your back up uh, or uses a term that you don't like or that seems anachronistic or, or maybe, you know, on the flip side, it's a young person, uh, you know, who uses pronouns that you're not familiar with and that makes you kind of uneasy and you don't understand why it is that you're being pushed to adopt this, uh, you know, way of speaking that to you seems ungrammatical and doesn't make a lot of sense. I would say trying to kind of listen and understand, well, what is the kernel behind what they're really asking for. I think when it comes to pronouns, you know, these are people who don't necessarily fit into our binary gender-based system and who are trying to forge an identity that's comfortable for them. It's not an easy position to be in if you don't uh, identify as male or female in our society. It poses challenges and to recognize, look, here's a human being who is grappling with this and here's the conclusion that they've drawn about how they want to present themselves to the world, how they want to be designated and called. And, you know, even though I'm not entirely comfortable with it, I'm going to go along with it. I'm going to try to support them. I'm going to listen to uh, and try to pull out what I think is the, you know, the valid core of what they're trying to do here and sort of, uh, you know, hear that and accommodate that. Awesome. Um... Thank you for that. Um, so the next one that I received, um, what is an effective way, we, you mentioned a little about the work of the PEN America. Um, I, I would love to hear more about your work that you do, but um, what are some effective ways that um, you're finding that help people identify that misinformation? Um, and are there tools that, um, that normal people like us can use? Um, yeah, there are. And in fact, we do whole trainings on the subject. And if there is interest even uh, among this group, we'd be happy to bring that training to you. And, you know, there are a series of elements to it. I mean, one is 
uh, looking at sort of the, what are the indicia of misinformation. You know, if something strikes you as completely outrageous, to at least have the threshold thought, you know, is this necessarily true? I mean, this morning there was a tweet by President Trump saying, uh, he, you know, shouldn't we postpone the election? And, you know, it turns out, well, that tweet was actually from him. If you go to Twitter, you can see this is his verified account. It has the little blue check. And, you know, in fact, he did say that. And so, okay, you know, we can react to that uh, and take it at face value. But in other instances, you know, there may be a photo of some outrageous scene of the protests in Portland. And yet that photo, if you uh, you look at its it, it, its origin, you know, was was taken in Ukraine, and there have been incidents like that just over the last few months of protests uh, around the world and police brutality uh, that's taken place in other countries being shared on social media as if it's happening in the United States. And there are methods that we teach for how to verify whether a photo uh, depicts what it seems to be you can do a reverse image search on Google. You can do that with video. And there are ways of verifying before you share something, before you push it out to your feed and say, oh my God, this is so outrageous. You know, we ask people to you know, take a check and make sure you really know what you're seeing and you're not accidentally you know, yourself becoming a purveyor of disinformation by spreading something around the origin of which you don't really know. Mm -hmm. So that's yeah. one piece of it. There's more about how, you know, how it is that understanding so how the brain works and how we evaluate information, particularly information that either uh, confirms or contradicts our own preconceptions. Yeah. And then, so just as important as those preconceptions, there's, there's that guttural response to seeing something. You're, you, you know you're seeing it, you know you're reading it. So your brain instantly goes to some place where you vet it for yourself. And sometimes it, we're in an environment where that vetting process that you, you mentioned with Amy of in the past, it's already been vetted and, and shown that what we're reading and what we're absorbing has already been uh, credited. It maybe may not be doing that any longer. So it's an interesting um, place that we're in. Um, so one, one question we have is, the, um, are there any lesson plans or curriculum um, tied to the, uh, your new book? And then, because uh, they're interested in using it for a class, um, teaching on banned books and free speech together. Yeah, there actually is. I actually have a, a draft of it that I need to review and edit and approve. But my publisher has prepared kind of a study guide uh, to use the book in classrooms, and that will be released uh, very soon, just as soon as I can get through it and they can push it out, because I know they they have an academic uh, publishing sales team that works with universities and they really want this. So uh, please stay tuned and it should be available shortly. And I would love, obviously, if you find the, bo the book useful in the classroom. You know, a lot of my goals, I mentioned at the beginning, was really to try to get across to a rising generation how it is that free speech values can help them achieve their goals. And so that audience is very important to me. Yeah, well, well I, I can, I, I'm in graduate school right now and I would absolutely love to uh, hear this conversation and, and continue this conversation longer. And I can only imagine that there's people my age and younger, older, everyone in between, um, that this is an important and interesting and complex and dynamic um, subject that it's, that I'm sure that's going to be very useful and very well received. Um, so thank you for that. Um, so we'll do one last question um, before we wrap it up. Um, and so there, there's, there's, it's a two, twofer, if you will. Um, so you talked about like leaning forward um, and understanding that it, it, you have to chew and walk, chew the gum and walk at the same time to really challenge ourselves, but challenge the people around us. Um, and so in my personal life, I know I've encountered, um, people that are only chewing gum or only walking. And sometimes for myself, I, I, I've realized that. Um, what's the best way that we can inspire ourselves? And then by leading with example, by showing that chewing gum and walking at the same time isn't as complicated and, and scary as it may seem, even if it raises the hair on your back at first. Yeah, sure. I mean, I think, you know, just to unpack for people, what I mean when I say walking and chewing gum at the same time is, look, the book has 20 separate principles in terms of how to defend free speech. And it's sort of the implication, you know, and, you know, actually what I sort of think is like you have to, it's a little, you know, maybe a better metaphor is uh, a one man band because you have to do, I think, a little bit of all of this, depending on the circumstances in order to make sure 
that as a speaker, your speech can be heard. You have an opportunity to persuade people that as a listener, you're taking in new ideas and not just responding to them reflexively, that you are an informed and responsible citizen when it, become, when it comes to these public debates on free speech issues. And look, I think you know, the best we can hope for anybody is to give some thought to the way that these ideas interplay and to sort of the series of, of methods and techniques that we can use to keep conversation going and to just try to bear those in mind when you have the impulse to you know, bristle at something and to clam up and to sort of say, you know, I absolutely disagree with what is being said in this conversation, but you know, I'll be damned if I'm gonna speak up because people are just gonna jump down my throat. And then, you know, giving it some more thought and thinking, well, you know, is there maybe a way that I can express this opinion? You know, if I begin by acknowledging, you know, what the other side is saying and by explaining what it is in my background that leads me to this conclusion, you know, maybe there's a way of getting it across. And so I, I'm hoping that by absorbing the book, I don't expect anybody to follow it, you know, kind of play by play. <laughs> uh, that I would ask far too much, but that by absorbing the ideas in the book, it becomes just a little bit easier to express a contested opinion, uh, you know, to respond to an idea that may make you feel uncomfortable, but without silencing speech, to have an opinion about what the role of government or corporation should be. And I also have, you know, a chapter at the end that is devoted to why we defend free speech in the, per in the first place. And that, you know, mm -hmm. it's really, I think, an important reminder of the value of free speech as a vehicle for allowing us to sort truth and fault from falsehood, uh, the, the, the chance to scrutinize ideas, to, for ideas to bump, bump up against one another and see which one remains standing for a kind of give and take that helps you to refine your ideas and to come to new understandings. It's also a catalyst for creativity and for innovation. It's, it's part of you know, what makes us human to be able to express ourselves and say what's on our mind and present an identity to the world that is consistent with you know, how we feel and how we see ourselves. And so I think it's worth remembering all those reasons that we protect free speech. And then you know, as we go through life, trying to bring some of that to our daily encounters. Yeah, that's a, that's a perfect way to, to those reminders of just how powerful um, free speech is and it's it's not like you said we everybody has that instinctual first reaction of what they think it is but then there it's when you do sit down and, and marinate with it and have conversations with people and interactions with people that maybe you're not agreeing with or have different perspectives um, you really get to get to see just how important it is um, and so it's I, I, I commend you and I thank you again um, for for writing this book and doing this work um, and coming to the library society and um, allowing our members to get, uh, listen to you uh, you and Amy this has uh, been a really special conversation um, and we thank you we're, we're wrapping it up right now but um, uh, we would gladly welcome you back in the future when when the pandemic has died down hopefully we can get you down uh from up north down to charleston and you yeah, i know it's so beautiful uh, yeah uh, we would love to host you um and have a, another special evening um, well thanks so much uh yeah, to all of you. The, the friends and supporters of Penn who are in the audience it's wonderful to see your faces i like your format where one can see uh who's out there and see how they're reacting so i've actually really enjoyed this many of these zooms you're sort of speaking into a blank screen and <laughs> i really I really appreciate the way that you've done this and uh, the chance to be here with all of you. So uh, thank you so much, Amy, for making this happen uh, and Dutch and Anne and the whole team. Thank you, thank you, Suzanne. Um, and I'm, I'm actually very, very happy to hear that you like this format because we, we've been debating whether we should go to our, the webinar format um, where it is, it, it may appear a little bit more professional and a little more sleek, um, but uh, we've had a lot of compliments from our members um, and because so many people are isolated at this time right now, it's nice to get to see familiar faces that you'd pass in the stacks and or pass at, in the aisles at an event. Um, so we, we kept 
hold of that atmosphere. Um, so I'm glad it's translating to uh, our, our speakers who have never even been here before. So that's awesome to hear. Um, and speaking of never been here before, I know uh, the pandemic has limited hours and access for the library, but um, we are open to our members. So if you are not a member of the Library Society, I implore that you join. Um, conversations like this one that we just had um, are pivotal and important and we love having them. So you're only gonna get to be experiencing more and more of them in the future. Um, so thank you, um, Suzanne, thank you so much once again. Amy, thank you. Um, and, and if you haven't already purchased a copy of Suzanne's book, Bucks and Books downstairs at 160 King Street has um, signed copies and they're, they are available for sale. They do local deliveries. They do um, shipping. Yep, okay. there it is right there. It's a beautiful book. I love the cover. Uh, so you have no excuse. You should definitely go buy one right now. Um, so thank you again. Um, and we'll talk soon, Suzanne. We'll see you. Bye-bye, okay. Charleston. Thank you.